Ready. All right. So shall we start now? All right. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining the the first session for the Quantum Science Center Summer School. I'm Xiaohui Xu from Purdue, and I'll be moderating the today's session. So today, I, uh, we will first have uh, opening re remarks from uh, Dr. Devin Dean and also Professor Alexander Guliseva. And uh, I think, first of all, we will start with uh, Dr. Devin Dean, the director of the Quantum Science Center. So David, whenever you're ready. Sure. So uh, welcome. Uh, I see we have about 40 people, um, probably going up in a few minutes, a little bit. Uh, welcome to the first Quantum Science Center Summer School. Um, this is a, the Quantum Science Center is one of the five U.S. Department of Energy uh, Quantum Information Research Centers, Quantum Information Science Research Centers. And our five-year mission uh, is really to I would say unblock and help make uh, quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum algorithm space grow. And uh, I think in, in that sense, uh, we're also working toward uh, workforce development efforts, and this is one of them, uh, to have a summer school, which is really a great thing. You know, I, in thinking about what to say here to you as a welcome, I thought about my own experiences as a student. And in 1988, which seems to be a long time ago now, I actually went to a summer school in uh, Corvallis, Oregon, as a third year graduate student entering the fourth year. And it was the first national nuclear physics summer school um, at that time, the first, number one. And it was really great. I met people there. Uh, that I became colleagues and friends with across the entire, across my entire career. And that was really a great experience. Um, I actually wrote uh, articles with a couple of the people who um, uh, spoke at the, at the event. Uh, I presented some of my own R&D and I, I uh, just got to know a lot of good people. And so you know, that's one of the aspects of um, the summer school that we hope happens. Now, we know we're online. We know we're not there in person. Uh, but I believe this is one of the big promises of a summer school to be able to connect you all with both speakers and with each other so that in the future of your careers, you'll kind of get together and um, uh, be able to do great things together. Interestingly, um, in 1996, I actually taught at one of the same summer schools. It was the eighth one at that time. And in 2003, I organized one uh, uh, for that series. It was the 15th one. And then in 2004 to 2007, I was the chair of the, of the organizing committee, the committee that uh, st uh, steered that effort. And then I spoke again in 2015. So that, su that particular summer school became a, a lifelong effort, so to speak. And that's why when we wrote the proposal, we were obviously gonna have a summer school. And I think having uh, somebody like Sasha uh, and the Purdue group uh, involved in the uh, QSC has been extremely useful in the sense because of the, of the character and nature of the students there at Purdue and because of the organizational capabilities that, that, are, uh, that are with us uh, through Purdue. And so um, it's a no-brainer. I'm glad you're here. I hope you guys have a great time. I will listen to a few of the talks off and on. Uh, and on Thursday, I think there's a uh, panel session, which actually I will be out of town. So actually, uh, Travis Humble is going to uh, oversee uh, at the end. So he's our deputy director for the center. Uh, so uh, we're really excited and we hope you all have a great time and uh, learn a lot. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to make mistakes and enjoy. And so, Sasha, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, thank you very much, David. Well, and thank you all for joining. So I'm Sasha Boltaseva, I'm professor of Purdue, and I'm workforce development lead at the Quantum Science Center. 
Um, so first of all, on behalf of the Quantum Science Center and Purdue Quantum Science and Engineering Institute, I am so excited about this school. We have absolutely outstanding speakers lined up for this week. Uh, we have over 400 registered participants. Now we are a little bit over 50, but we will get more, I'm absolutely sure. And we are streaming it live on YouTube. Well, first of all, I know usually we say thanks at the end of the event, but I would like to extend my thanks to the whole team who actually put this together. And when we started the workforce development activities at the center, we immediately said that it has to be driven by students and postdocs. And largely, it is driven by students and postdocs. And my special thanks for the team of moderators and, and um, the students and postdocs involved in the school uh, who actually helped greatly to put this all together. And this team is led by Alex uh, Senechev, um, who has been extremely uh, instrumental and important for putting this together. Uh, many thanks to Managing Director of Purdue Quantum Science and Engineering Institute, David Stewart, and our Administrative um, Angel at the Quantum Science Center, Erica Valentine, and the whole workforce development team. Um, we do believe, uh, as, as David already said, uh, that one of the most important things for uh, people at any career stage is networking. And even though we are virtual, uh, we do hope that you will connect to your mentors, your uh, senior team members, to our speakers, and to your peers. Um, so with that, I guess um, I, let's just get started. We have such an exciting program ahead, and I am really looking forward to every single talk that we're going to hear this week. Um, so we are streaming live on YouTube, as I already mentioned. Um, and I guess with that, I will hand it over back to Xiaowei who will um, be introducing our very first, very honorable speaker. Looking forward to that. All Thanks. right, thank you. Thank you, Sasha and David for the very exciting opening remarks. So next we have two uh, interesting talks. The first one will be from Professor Mikhail Lukin from uh, Harvard. And he, he is the George Vasma Labret Professor of Physics. And the title is The New Frontier of Quantum Science and Engineering. So I like if you have any questions, I would recommend you to like either type in the Q&A uh, channel or in the chat channel, and we'll try to address them at the end of the talk. So uh, Professor Lukin, uh, please. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. And uh, I feel really honored to give the very first um, talk at this, you know, uh, very special summer school, which I hope will indeed will become a tradition for many years to come. So uh, let me just start kind of at a high level, you know, so I guess, you know, what uh, we do in our world is we are trying to uh, develop this new field of quantum science and engineering, which uh, uh, we view as a quest for controlling quantum world. So in this quest, what we are trying to do is we're trying to isolate and control simple quantum objects and build more and more complex systems from them. And with that, we hope to really explore new frontiers of science with this kind of engineered, engineered many body quantum systems like create and probe new states of matter, but also explore new applications. And applications are quantum processing, communications and metrology. And this field, despite all of this excitement, despite all of these new centers which appear, kind of uh, quantum centers which appear nearly daily, uh, faces two big um, challenges. One is the challenge of building large-scale quantum systems. Right now, we do not know if and how we can build, for example, truly large-scale quantum computers. And then another challenge is that even if you build one of these computers these days, you wouldn't actually know exactly what to use it for. And this is what I call quantum application challenge. How can we apply these machines to achieve useful quantum advantage? 
So uh, in this field, you know, we are kind of often talk about quantum rivalries. So it could be rivalries between different physical platforms, between different countries, or between different quantum centers. But the actual uh, the actual rivalry here is really uh, between two contradictory forces of nature. One of the force is a controllability to really, you know, kind of make use of the quantum phenomena for interesting applications. We really need to control uh, qubits, you know, at an unprecedented level, you know, at unprecedented level, one by one. But another one is scalability, right? We will need to have large number of those. And these two forces of nature are, you know, often do not like co to coexist together. So basically, this is not only true in quantum world, it's also true in classics, classical world, even in the social um, uh, interactions. If you have a large group of very smart people, it becomes very difficult to control. But, you know, in, in, the, in the domain of quantum physics, this is uh, definitely an outstanding challenge. And basically where the field is, we would like to kind of build big enough, programmable enough, and coherent enough systems such that we can really control, gain access and control systems of more than 100 quantum bits. And with this, we hope to gain some knowledge to build even bigger and better quantum machines and also start addressing this algorithm and, and application challenge. And what I hope to convince you by the end of my talk, we're already in, entering this very interesting kind of domain um, or the world, if you want, uh, where actually no one has ever been. So it's kind of like a part of the, uh, we can create states no one has ever created. And so this, um, uh, in, in, in doing that, we really have an opportunity to start kind of discovering new things. And so for this reason, I like to call this, what's happening now is the age of quantum discovery. So um, in thinking about what to do, I was actually somehow, you know, was wondering what can I do, you know, what kind of talk can I give, uh, which would somehow try to cover the broad range of scientific activities that you guys are planning to undertake in your center, ranging from optics all the way to topological qubits, and also give it in a way which is a little bit kind of tutorial. So. So I decided to focus, you know, basically on, you know, one set of projects in our lab. And this is a, a project involving building scalable quantum systems using Rindberg atom array. So I'll tell you uh, how we can use basically laser beams, steerable laser beam to build, you know, systems, you know, atom by atom. Uh, 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 and, you know, systems which are as large as, you know, 300 qubits and how to control such systems. And, you know, uh, I will also then tell you about some uh, ongoing work in our labs to use the systems as programmable quantum simulators. So in particular, I will tell you a little bit how we can explore phases and phase transitions in two-dimensional spin models. But then as a kind of outlook, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn the attention to the topological physics and actually describe you uh, some of our very recent work uh, involving the first realization of something which is called topological spin liquid. This is basically a, you know, um, a long sought state of matter, which is a basis for topological qubits. And I will tell you a little bit about our, you know, work building a baby kind of qubit. And I'll come back then to, with the ideas of toward scaling up and show again how kind of modern optical techniques can really allow us to push over the, this system. So uh, during my talk, please feel free to ask any questions and I will actually moreover uh, make uh, two uh, uh, stops in the middle of the talk to uh, kind of enable the discussion. Okay, so in this talk, we will be focusing on um, uh, discussing quantum processors ba based on individual cold neutral atoms. And uh, those systems uh, have some obvious advantages. For example, they have feature excellent coherence properties. 
for example, modern optical clocks are based on neutral um, uh, atoms. And it's also uh, very easy to create large number of neutral atoms. So for example, in each you know, of our room, there are a lot of atoms and molecules flying around. So in principle, if you could somehow you know, track every one of them and control every one of them, you would have a big quantum computer at your disposal. But uh, there are also some challenges in doing that. And there are two uh, maybe key challenges in this field is one is that, that atoms in the gas phase typically interact very weakly with each other. And uh, um, moreover, atoms uh, in uh, um, neutral atoms in particular, are very hard to control individually, at least in large numbers. So that's kind of, you know, this idea that you can somehow trace as atoms as they fly around, you know, it's makes it almost impossible to think about any kind of, you know, realistic application of this approach. So motivated by this consideration, um, a few years ago, uh, we started to think about new approach to build to building quantum systems. And in particular, what we wanted to do is we wanted to um, uh, address this individual control challenge. And our approach um, is based on the optical techniques, in particular on something which is called optical tweezers. So um, uh, basically, you know, what's optical tweezer? So if you take um, a, 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 a beam of light and focus it very sharply, uh, then uh, what will happen is that this beam will actually um, start attracting, you know, any objects with the, uh, with which have some finite polarizability. So basically, you know, and, and, and these particles will typically be attracted to the point of highest intensity, which is basically the, 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 the focal point. And, you know, since atoms, individual atoms have some finite pol polarizability, you can use this approach to trap, to basically trap individual atoms. And that's the basis for something which is called optical tweezer, the technique which exists now for, you know, several uh, decades. And so what we do in our approach is we start with the gas uh, of the atoms, which is slowed by conventional laser cooling uh, technique. And then uh, what we do is we, you know, in, it's a, it happens in a vacuum chamber. And then basically in this vacuum chamber, we shine typically not just one focused beam of light, we shine, you know, hundreds uh, of, 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 this, uh, of these beams. And each of these beams we focus so tightly that it basically can um, uh, accommodate at most one atom. So basically it turns out that if more than one atom is captured, you know, then this, these two atoms just cannot fit into the such a uh, tightly focused tweezer, you know, and they, they just get ejected. And so in practice, then what happens is that, you know, on each approach, we try to load these optical tweezers and we end up uh, with, uh, with the set of traps, some of which are filled by one atom and some are empty. So the system like that uh, has some entropy and we um, get rid of this entropy by simply taking a picture of this, um, uh, of this uh, loaded atoms, figure out which traps are full and which are empty, and then basically eliminate the empty trap and then kind of rearrange the rest of the atoms in, in a uh, kind of desired geometry. So with that, we end up with the system of uh, individual atoms prepared in well-defined internal states, which are typically separated by few micrometers. And you know, such uh, uh, system is completely classical. These atoms do not interact with each other. The interaction is negligible. So to induce the interaction, uh, what we do is we excite these atoms into their states with high principal quantum number. So these are the so-called Rydberg states. And in this kind of Rydberg states, the atomic size grows dramatically, and then the atoms really start, you know, feeling each other's presence. And that way, we can enable, you know, highly programmable. Uh, uh, coherent quantum mechanical interactions between them. So this is the basis for our uh, joint project uh, together with my colleagues, Markus Greiner and Vlad and Mulitic. So uh, as I already mentioned, so Rydberg atoms, you know, play a central role in this. So uh, this is just kind of uh, uh, a reminder from the uh, 
quantum mechanics 101. So basically, if you take hydrogen atom and put them, or hydrogen-like atom, and put it in a state with large n, what happens is that uh, uh, its size grows quadratically with, uh, with, with, with n, and for n equals 100, it's actually you know, a pro starts, it becomes a fraction of the micrometer, you know, and so at the same time, with this large object, you know, you also have some very high polarizability, so that means that if you apply electric field, you know, your, your uh, you know, the, the object becomes very easily polarized, and as a consequence, then there is also very strong interaction between these two Rydberg atoms, so basically the interaction uh, um, uh, scales as 11th power of principal quantum number, and for n equals 100, the interaction, the Van der Waal interaction is 14 orders of magnitude stronger than between the ground state atoms. So this 14 orders of magnitude is a large number, and we can make a very good use of this type of interaction. So one way how we can use this interaction is uh, in a phenomenon which is called Rydberg blockade. So what is that? So it is, um, uh, uh, it, it can be understood the following. So suppose you have now two atoms, which are far away from each other, which you are trying to excite with laser beams into the Rydberg states in a coherent way. So under these conditions, what will happen is that the, um, uh, the atoms will undergo independent radio oscillations and uh, you know they will just not feel each other's presence. However, if you start now bringing this atom close, closer and closer together, at some point, these uh, interactions between Rydberg atoms will become substantial and actually will take over to the point where you are, if you are still trying to excite atoms resonantly, you will be able to excite one atom or another, but never both. And so, and in, under these conditions, you're entering the regime um, of the so-called Rydberg blockade where simultaneous excitation is blocked. So it's uh, blocked at distances smaller than what's called blockade radius. And this, it turns out to be a very effective way to kind of entangle atoms, manipulate their quantum state, because under this blockade, uh, this entanglement mechanism is insensitive to things like motion and position of the atoms. So in short, what we uh, will be doing um, in our experiments, we'll be starting with the uh, with uh, some disordered arrays and then sorting atoms in a way you know that we wish. So creating some regular arrays of the atoms and subjecting them to um, uh, sequences of laser pulses and then eventually uh, reading out their you know state in a projective measurement just by kind of looking at the state dependent fluorescence. So, uh, so that's kind of a high level um, uh, uh, approach. So kind of uh, in practice uh, now, and it, it's kind of very generic, right? So, but in practice, uh, um, what um, uh, we can do, we could choose the type of atom that we want to work with. And um, uh, uh, often these experiments uh, utilize the so-called alkali hydrogen-like atom. So for example, I will be showing the results from the experiments involving rubidium atoms. But there is also some effort now to, for example, create um, atom arrays using alkali earth atoms like strontium and terbium. Then you also you know, have a lot of possibilities how to encode a qubit in each of the atom. And so in particular, uh, um, uh, uh, what I will mostly focus on today is um, uh, the approach involving what, what we call ground Rydberg encoding. So basically, you know, where you encode a qubit in the superposition of the ground state and a Rydberg state, where Rydberg state is a state with uh, high n. But alternatively, one can also encode a qubit in the hyperfine states of atoms. And basically, you know, that way you can you know, have a very long lifetime, basically many seconds of the lifetime. And then if you want to turn on the interactions between atoms, you just excite it into the Rydberg state. So this kind of uh, methods can be applied to all sorts of, you know, directions involving um, quantum computing, quantum simulation, quantum networking, quantum metrology. Uh, but I kind of like uh, to think about this approach as basically implementing the 
the original vision of, of Richard Feynman, who is actually was a paper which started this kind of entire field of quantum information processing, where he noted that, you know, basically, if you want to use classical computers, uh, then to, uh, to model quantum system in general, this will be very hard. So for example, if you have n uh, quantum bits, uh, then to model the evolution of these n quantum bits, it will require a solution to the two to the n uh, coupled equations. And you know, if n is small, it's you know maybe you know five or ten. You can easily write them down and solve the, uh, them on your laptop. But when n you know starts approaching a number of something like fifty, it becomes very very hard. Just it's you know it's impossible to kind of even store this kind of uh, this uh, uh, the, the the information required to solve this equation. So the alternative approach uh, is to basically implement a, a model of this interacting system. You know where you can basically build this system from well controlled elements, and you have some standard set of qubits with programmable interactions. And this is exactly what this approach, which I am kind of describing, implements. Right. So you basically can. You know, build the system from individual atoms, position them, you know, engineer interactions, you know, adjust the interactions between them, and then with that, you know, kind of, you know, proceed with the time uh, evolution. So what's kind of most natural uh, uh, kind of application of that? The application of, of that system would be quantum simulations. And uh, um, uh, if you, uh, uh, for example, start with the one-dimensional chain of, of the atoms and, and excite them into the Rydberg state, as, as shown here, such a system can be described by this fairly simple Hamiltonian, which actually is an Ising type, you know, Hamiltonian is just written in a little bit, you know, different way. So n now is here is a number of Rydberg atoms on each side, so it's zero, one. And you can kind of understand, and, and so omega is a Rabi frequency uh, of exciting laser, and delta is a laser detuning, and, and V is an interaction. And so you can understand the, the physics which this Hamiltonian described by looking at, uh, at, uh, at its ground state and its ground state phase diagram. And in particular, you can parameterize it by using two um, parameters. One is a normalized detuning. So it will act as a kind of chemical potential in this model. And another one is the interaction strength. And so basically, you know, if the interactions are negligible, then the ground state, you know, is full, is totally determined by the sign of this detuning. If this detuning is negative, then all atoms should be in a ground state, right? Because basically you want to minimize this energy of this uh, Hamiltonian. So N should be zero, but if the detuning is positive, then all atoms should be in the Lindbergh state, in the excited state. But of course, the state like this is incompatible with blockade. So if you have you know, any interactions, even just limited to nearest neighbor, you will not be able to reach this kind of state. So basically, if you have you know, short range interactions you know, with nearest neighbor blockaded, then what will happen is that the, 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 uh, the state with most um, uh, Rydberg atoms you can uh, excite will be the state shown here. You know, this is a state where you basically have up, down, up, down, up, down. So the state satisfies the, the blockade constraint and it has actually has an order. It's kind of anti-ferromagnetic order. And uh, this actually state breaks the so-called Z2 symmetry. But if you now increase the range of interactions, the range of blockade even more, then what will happen is you will blockade not just the first uh, nearest neighbor, but also the second nearest neighbor. And so then you will break Z2, Z3 symmetry. Sorry, you will have states up, down, down, up, down, down, and so on. And then this kind of this hierarchy continues. So now, can we? how can we probe? So it's actually a phase diagram, which has been already known for this kind of model, you know, for, for, for a while, how can we probe it experimentally? It's actually very easy for us to do it, you know. So what we can do is we can just start with all atoms in the ground state, adjust the interaction strength and, st and spacing such that you know we have you know you know only certain number of nearest neighbors as under blockade, and then just try to adiabatically sweep the detuning, you know. Uh, uh, from negative to the positive value and then basically you know we immediately readily you know create this this state so this is you know some of our first results for this chain of 13 atoms so where we basically you know start with all atoms in the ground state and here enter 
into this state, you know, where you have Rydberg atom shown here with the red circle, ground state atom, Rydberg atom, ground state atom. You know, if we now, you know, bring the atoms a little bit closer, then, you know, not only the first neighbor is located, but only a second nearest neighbor. And, you know, basically what you see here is that these programmable interactions result in a desired symmetry breaking. So basically using this approach in the past, you know, couple of years, we actually have really enjoyed a wide variety of opportunities. We have used this approach to, um, uh, for example, implement uh, high fidelity entanglement and, you know, parallel multi-qubit quantum gate operations. We uh, explored phase transitions in arrays, you know, exceeding 50 atoms. Uh, we also studied uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. So that's actually an area which is perhaps most interesting for uh, for applications, because, you know, if you take quantum system, any body quantum system and push it away from equilibrium, uh, you know, it, it starts evolving in a kind of highly non-trivial way. And actually this phenomenon is extremely hard to predict numerically. And in fact, you know, basically every time we did this on equilibrium experiment, we would, you know, discover something. Then we also use this approach to create a large scale entangled state. So this is actually a 20 atom GG state, which was the time the largest, you know, in fact, the record only was broken just a couple of months ago where, you know, few more qubits have been entangled. So basically, all of these directions are very closely connected because it involves co coherent high fidelity, either analog or digital um, uh, evolution. So maybe at this point, I would like to, to slow down a little bit and, you know, um, see if there are any questions. So this is kind of was a basic, you know, uh, overview of this of this area. And let me just see if there are any questions about that. Yes, there are like uh, quite a few questions already there. Okay. Um, Professor looking, can you see them? I can. I, I, maybe I can pick two of them and then leave the rest to the end of the talk. Why if don't you, you how time. about you ask them? I think it's better if yeah. you ask somehow. I cannot, you know, I cannot sure. see them all. Somehow. Yeah. Okay, so one of the question is uh, about how do the lifetimes of the Rydberg states compared with the lifetime of the hyperfine levels used for encoding qubits? Yeah, so, yeah, so the lifetimes of the Rydberg states, um, are relatively long, you know, they are typically, you know, for the states we use, they, they are hundreds of, of microseconds. Uh, and compared to interactions, for example, you know, you know, interaction strengths, they are relatively long. Uh, but, you know, of course, they are much shorter uh, than the lifetimes of the ground hyperfine sublevels, which are typically limited by basically how well you, for example, control magnetic fields, you know, how good is your vacuum. So it can be easily be, you know, seconds, you know, or, or even, you know, longer hours, you know. So, and um, uh, that actually is a kind of very special feature because it allows us to, you know, this hierarchy of lifetimes really allows us to create, to, to make use of the, uh, of the situations where you can have, for example, very long-lived memory uh, for the qubits on one hand, and also, you know, very strong interaction. So basically, the combination of very strong interaction and a relatively long lifetime, hundreds of microseconds in Rydberg states, you know, allows us to perform high-fidelity operations. But at the same time, you know, if you really want to kind of shelve the qubit and store it for some time, then you can use a hyperfine state. And we are starting to use these kind of features, right, in, in, in the experiments. We'll maybe not talk about them, but, you know, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. And maybe we have one more question uh, for now. So um, how to excite uh, atoms into the Rydberg states while keeping them trapped in the tweezer? Yeah, that's, that's actually also an excellent question. So, um, uh, and Rydberg atoms uh, generally have very different polarizability from the ground state atoms. And in fact, depending on the color of light that you use to trap atoms, you know, in some cases, and, and, and the Rydberg state, in some cases, those Rydberg states will be trapped. In some cases, they will not be trapped. 
uh, in fact, they can be anti-trapped. So what that means is that um, in, you know, in our, uh, but, you know, but actually also if, if the Rindberg atoms are trapped, then often the trapping potential will be very different. And this actually is a challenge because if you then create a superposition of ground and Rindberg uh, atoms, you know, this superposition will basically undergo kind of motional dephasing. So for these reasons, in most of our experiments, what we like to do is that before we, we create the arrays and we store our qubits, but during the time when we excite the atoms to the Rydberg state, we actually uh, typically turn the traps off. And uh, this, um, uh, you would say, well, what, but what happened with trapping, the atoms will fly, fly away, but so, the, Typically, this does not happen because we turn the traps off and we do the Rydberg excitation within the time, which is much, much shorter compared to a typical kind of motional time scales of atoms. And so, you know, for these reasons, for example, we can basically turn the trap off, excite the atoms, you know, do Rydberg manipulation, you know, bring the atoms back and then they turn the traps on, you know, and basically the probability of atom loss is very, very small in, under these conditions. I see. Thanks, Professor. I think we'll save the rest of the questions to the end of the talk. Okay. All right. Thank you. So um, we will then proceed. And, you know, what I will talk uh, uh, now about is the second generation of our experiments, which we implemented about a year ago, actually. We implemented a major upgrade in which we can now control two-dimensional atom arrays. And the key part of this upgrade is this device called Special Light Modulator, which is basically a computer-generated hologram, um, uh, kind of diffraction, uh, the, the, the kind of the grating, basically, uh, this, uh, uh, where you can imp imp imprint, for example, face on, on, on a light beam. And as a result, basically, by kind of reflecting uh, the, uh, the beam from this SLM, you can, you know, depending on the pattern that you you know, uh, uh, create, you can actually deflect the beam in a kind of different directions. And basically you can create now two dimensional um, uh, uh, arrays of, 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 of traps. And so basically when we uh, image it in the vacuum chamber, we can e easily create um, uh, arrays of, uh, of hundreds of, uh, of thousands of traps as shown here. Now the disadvantage of this special light modulator is actually is very slow to update. So uh, for this uh, reason, we have uh, a second kind of channel and we have a second set of laser beams, which we use to sort the atoms. And you know, this second channel has two devices which are called acousto-optic deflectors where you basically, you know, by putting in RF tones, you can actually steer these beams and, and, and kind of, you know, in this way, you can move the atoms, you know, uh, between different, you know, uh, traps. And basically in this way, you can actually sort, uh, sort the atoms and everything is now, of course, computer controlled. So uh, one other thing uh, which happened is that basically just at the time when we completed our, you know, uh, upgrade, that was kind of the middle of the March, that's, you know, when the the COVID shutdown has started. And actually, uh, fortunately, we had about a week of warning. And during that week, we actually were able to convert this uh, uh, um, experiment uh, into complete uh, remote uh, control. And this is thanks to this amazing group of people, you know, who actually, you know, is responsible for all of this kind of results. So basically, with all of that, you know, we are now for last year, we have been operating this um, second generation atom array. And so the beauty here in these two dimensions, we can create a wide variety of, of different uh, uh, lattices, both regular uh, lattices and also random lattices. So for example, if in this case, if we would like to create this randomly filled, you know, pattern, you know, we just program it and then try to to create it in, in the experiment and indeed it kind of works. And basically, you know, at this point, you know, we uh, uh, start with about 600 traps and, you know, we have 
over 50% of filling. So we can uh, create approximately, you know, 300 sorted, uh, uh, sorted atoms with kind of a reasonable probability. So um, what do we do with that? And so the first uh, 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 approach to benchmark it was to uh, basically explore uh, you know, quantum phases and quantum phase transitions that you can basically create in this two-dimensional platform. And again, so this is this Hamiltonian, which I already have discussed. Uh, so if we, for example, start in a square lattice, um, uh, then the simplest phase which we will create will be a two-dimensional uh, uh, anti-ferromagnetic phase. So this will happen if you have only uh, short range interaction. So basically this is a phase which, you know, uh, which you will create. So we call it a checkerboard phase because it's basically around a Rydberg atoms kind of a different color, if you want. Uh, but, you know, uh, of course, again, we can start playing with interaction range. And then, you know, it turns out that under these conditions, you can create a wide variety of all different type of phases. And there is actually quite complex phase diagram, which again, you can very easily explore by just, for example, changing the interaction strength and changing the distance between the atoms. So this, all of these phase diagrams can now be accessed. In fact, we already kind of explored and realized and explored most of these phases. But you know, prior to this work, um, even this very basic transition from the uh, what's called disordered from a trivial phase into a checkerboard phase, you know, and this is a, um, a two-dimensional uh, 2D Ising quantum phase transition. It turned out has never been observed previously. Okay, so how can we? Uh, study it. So we can study it by starting, the, by preparing a square array of individual atoms. So that's a picture of individual atoms. And then uh, again, in a spirit similar to what I just described, so we can just start changing the detuning uh, slowly uh, from negative to positive um, uh, 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 value. And then uh, eventually we should order the order, uh, enter the ordered phase. And you know, then we can take the picture of atoms, and indeed, in some cases, we see this perfect anti-ferromagnetic pattern, you know, across the entire. Array. So, uh, um, okay, you know, admittedly, this is not always the case that you have a perfectly ordered pattern. So, you know, how can we quantify it? There are a few ways. So, one of them we can look at the correlation function. You know, so this is this kind of up, down, up, down, up, down correlation, you know, across in, and then actually it turns out these correlations, you know, spread across the entire array. We can also look um, at distribution of microscopic states. So it turns out that actually, you know, most of the states that you create, you know, and there are many of them now, you know, there is basically two to the power of uh, number of atoms uh, uh, in total states. Many of them, you know, occur only once. Uh, and some occur, you know, twice and three times, but actually it turns out that the most probable state is actually, you know, or two states are the state of the type shown here, where you have perfect anti-ferromagnetic ordering and also another complementary state, which is basically, you know, where the order is just shifted by um, kind of one, um, one unit. So, and, you know, by doing these kind of experiments, we can also, for example, you know, quantify benchmark how well our system works. So this is uh, the, the, the probability to find a perfect, perfectly ordered ground state pattern. So it's actually decreases exponentially, uh, but, you know, it kind of from here, you know, we can, um, for example, estimate the error and it actually turns out that during entire procedure, including preparation, evolution and readout, their per atom is about three percent. Uh, but how can we actually, you know, study if so? So far, this is basically all like all of these images are classical. Like how you know what are the quantum aspects of this? Is there some quantumness in the system? And actually, to do it, we really focused on this um, Ising quantum phase transition. And um, uh, it's known from the theory of quantum phase transitions is that basically they can be all placed in different universality class where they are characterized by something which is called critical exponents. And we can study these critical exponents by basically you know, uh, going across the phase transition uh, with different uh, rate, with different speed. So in fact, if we go quickly, 
then what happens is that the system does not have enough time to build the correlation. So we build a short range correlation, but if we go slowly, then that's where the correlation spread across the entire system. And actually we can plot, for example, a correlation length. And indeed you see that if you go slowly, you know, you build correlation, but if you go uh, quickly, the correlations build much more slowly. So basically the way how to measure this critical exponent is use this idea of universality. So what you should do, you should basically um, rescale all of this, you know, curve with the speed with which you are going. And then it turns out from this rescaling, you can actually extract these critical exponents. And indeed, what we find is that if we do this rescaling, these curves, you know, collapse on the top of each other, you know, and then by optimizing this collapse, we actually can, you know, extract the, uh, the critical exponent, which is actually consistent with the uh, quantum, uh, Ising quantum phase transition in two plus one dimensions. And it's actually di distinct from, for example, classical transitions for, or from quantum transition in different dimensionality. So this is something that we can really use as a benchmark for, for quantum many body dynamics. So with tools like that over the last year, we have actually enjoyed, you know, a wide variety of, you know, uh, of cool experiments. So we explored this uh, uh, two-dimensional phase diagrams. We studied quantum dynamics and kind of more recently, we were looking into this topological phases and starting to think about this combinatorial optimization and also push the system uh, towards a universal programmability. But be before I go into some of these advanced topics, so perhaps I can um, slow down here and again ask if there are any questions. Yeah, there is one more related question uh, for this section. So the question is about how much time does it take to set up this 2D array of atoms and uh, like a brief a brief introduction about the steps involved will be also uh, yeah, So basically, yeah, so these steps I in principle have explained. So what you need to do, you need to first load the atoms in the straps produced by a special light modulator. Then you need to take an image to figure out which straps are full and which are empty. And then, you know, you turn on this uh, second set of, of tweezer beams, you know, using these acousto-optic deflectors to move them to, to sort these atoms. Then we typically take another image to see how well our rearrangement you know, works. So, and then afterwards we basically start the experiment. So the, exp the experiment itself, this Rydberg excitation and evolution is typically quite, you know, is rather quick. It takes, you know, maybe, you know, typically a few microseconds at most because the interactions are very strong. But this kind of this preparation and readout procedure, it is what it takes time. So basically overall, um, you know, this uh, kind of rearrangement and taking the images and, and, and loading and so on, it takes um, in total, typically, you know, close to maybe 100 milliseconds, you know, so basically we have, as a result, you know, we have a repetition rate of a few shots per second. So this is not certainly not optimized. It can be kind of much faster, but you know, only a small fraction of that is actual coherent manipulation. Now, most of the time is, you know, is in you know preparing and actually reading out the result. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Yeah, that's the only question I see right now. Okay. All right, so then I will try to move maybe in somewhat more advanced topic. So, okay, so that's, you know, there are many applications of this approach to, from many body physics to computing and metrology. And so basically what I will try to do in next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, focus on one, on some of the, one of the, our most recent experiment where we create and, and, and uh, probing so-called topological phases. Okay, so first off, what's it all about? So, um, uh, about five decades ago, uh, P.W. Anderson, a very famous condensed matter physicist, postulated the possibility of existence of the so-called quantum spin liquids. So, and basically 
you know, what he already kind of at the time was thinking about that this could be a very special matter, uh, you know, which properties are really determined by the system's topology, right? So you can basically, if you create this face, you can not destroy it kind of easily. So you basically, you cannot destroy it by continuous deformation. You need to really, you know, cut somehow the system, right? You need to change the topology. And, uh, um, uh, you know, this, um, in particular, this kind of phases of matter, you know, uh, uh, you know, he thought could be really realized in the systems which have something which is called frustration. So imagine that you have, a, again, a magnetic system where you can, you know, have, you know, spins, uh, for example, in this triangular lattice. And suppose the interaction is anti-ferromagnetic. So basically, if your if this spin is up, then you know to satisfy this anti-ferromagnetism, you need to place the near the neighbors, the near neighbors should be down. So, but the problem here is that if you make this spin point down, so where do you put this other spin here? Right? You, so that's this frustration. So uh, and basically, you know, kind of starting from this idea, there has been an intense, you know, almost, you know, five decade kind of, you know, uh, uh, quest in exploring if states like this can really be, you know, created and people realize that kind of the most likely scenarios in this case, what will happen is that, you know, this um, uh, spins here, they will form this kind of singlet bonds. So they are so-called dimers, right? And basically you could kind of envision the state of matter where these dimers cover, you know, all of these, you know, possible spin configurations. In fact, uh, this um, uh, 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 gave rise to this idea of resonating valence bond states where you basically have these dimers, which, you know, continuously, you know, flip flop between each other. And as a result, create these states, which are basically superpositions of all of these kind of dimer coverings, you know. So basically, this was the work which is done in a kind of condensed matter physics side of uh, uh, um, uh, things. But actually, about 20 years ago, um, Alexei Kitaev realized that these ideas of topology and uh, uh, of topological protections can be used to encode and protect quantum information. And that's uh, uh, the basis for this fault-tolerant topological, you know, quantum uh, computing. And, you know, the famous thing which actually he at the time put forward together is this kind of toric code. So basically, those are kind of very strange states because they don't have a local special order. So you can basically not distinguish this if the system is in the state or not by just looking all, uh, locally. So basically, they are kind of superpositions of all of these kind of, you know, dimer you know, fluctuating dimers. So they basically should have some very large ground state degeneracy. So in order to basically observe and distinguish them, you have to measure some kind of topological operators. And in this case of Alexei, you know, it's basically the so-called, you know, string operators. So basically product of, you know, either X or Z operators, which cover the entire, um, you know, uh, system in this case, uh, uh, two-dimensional system. So basically, these are this kind of famous systems which are supposed to feature topological robustness and, you know, they're the basis for topological quantum computing. Uh, but as you guys probably know, there is up to now no conclusive experimental evidence in any systems today if such states can ever be created. And they have not been created up to now. So um, motivated by this consideration, about a year ago, we started, you know, uh, uh, discussing with our uh, condensed matter colleagues, you know, Subir Sajdi and Ashwin Vishwana, who fought about this topological matter for a long time in case of Subir for you know, almost 40 years. Uh, if we could actually create such states in our Rydberg uh, system. And in fact, they came up with two ideas uh, to realize <laughs> some such, such states, which actually by now we have both implemented. So I'll focus here on this uh, idea from um, uh, Ashwin, uh, Vishwana and his uh, uh, postdoc Ruben, you know, where basically uh, 
the atoms should be placed on links of the so-called Kagame lattice, or it's also this arrangement alternatively is called the Ruby lattice. Okay, so what's the idea? What's up? Sorry, this was not planned. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Distortion. Most interesting part. So, do you see? So, I'll share again. Okay, so what's, uh, so what's the idea? The idea is basically the following. So uh, let us, you know, place the atoms on the links of, the, of this ruby lattice. And let us also uh, adjust the blockade radius such that for every excited atom, uh, every atom in Rydberg state, its six nearest neighbors are blockaded. So in this case, uh, you will have at most one quarter atoms excited in a Rydberg state. And you can formally map this kind of uh, um, model with maximal feeling into this dimer model where basically every Rydberg atom corresponds to the dimer you know, living on, on, on a link of this Kagame lattice. And this Rydberg blockade constraint ensures that no two dimers touch a single vortex. So basically they create this so-called dimer cover. So what's a spin liquid state in this case? Well, it should be a superposition of, there should be a macroscopic number of these dimer coverings. And basically spin liquid should be a superposition of all of these possible dimer coverings. So, uh, uh, so how can one see this? Well, okay, so we can start and do the experiment. So these are this, uh, the atoms, which are a picture of the atoms, which are placed on this Kagame lattice. And when we basically adjust Rydberg blockade appropriately, you know, we, you know, do the adiabatic evolution and then create a state like this, right? And the state, it's roughly consistent with all, you know, dimer, you know, kind of, uh, perfect dimer covering. It's not perfect. There are some, you know, kind of, sometimes there are some errors. But most importantly is, you know, in, if you have pictures like this, how do you actually realize, how do you, can you think, you know, how can you probe if you're in a topological phase or not? So that's a big question. Okay, so let's kind of look at this state a little bit more carefully. So that's a pulse sequence, which we kind of use. And basically we can look, for example, at average number of occupation. And indeed we see that there is this kind of, you know, almost like a plateau around uh, uh, one quarter um, uh, uh, filling. But again, there is nothing, you know, super special which happens here, you know. So yeah, it's, it's true that there is kind of the curve plateaus, but, you know, you can really not, you know, you know, say anything conclusively about, you know, uh, you know, what emerges here. So instead, what we need to do, we need to go back to this kind of idea of Tori code and think about how to measure this string operators, this string observables. But this one type of string is actually relatively easy to understand. So let's consider uh, the um, one component of the state, and that's a state which, you know, corresponds to a dimer covering. And let's draw the loop which, you know, goes around, you know, uh, like one vertex, like, like shown here. So if this state is a dimer covering, then this loop will cross exactly one Rydberg atom. And so basically, if you assign the, to the ground state atom the value plus one and to the Rydberg atom minus one, then the parity of the loop here will be minus one. So this is like a Gauss law, basically. And actually, if you go now, if you take a bigger loop, then you know the expectation value of the Z operator will be minus one to the power of enclosed number of vertices. And indeed, you know, if we now plot this expectation of the Z string, you know, as we enter this phase, we observe that indeed, you know, depending on the type of loop, you know, we see some emergence of either positive or negative parity. And indeed it is exactly 
that the um, uh, uh, the number of the enclosed vertices, which determines you know what sort of you know parity you know we create. So and we observe here that we can uh, 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 we have non-zero parity for you know relatively large loop for loops compared to the basically system size, even though as a loop size increases, you know the parity you know decreases. So basically, you know what these string operators allow us to do is allow us to reveal transition into the dimer phase. But there is something more that we have to do, and then we have to show basically that our state is superposition of this dimer covering. So that actually looks very scary, very non-trivial, but it turns out that there is a way to do it. And in order to do it, we need to evaluate this off-diagonal string operator. So this off-diagonal operator is an operator which acts when it acts on one of the, you know, uh, link of our lattice, it somehow flips, you know, these dimers around. So the, uh, you know, kind of the intuition for that is the following. So basically, if you look at this kind of closed string, then it turns out that this state takes any dimer covering and converts it into another one. So that's the one how it's shown here. So this in this way is very similar to the single qubit where you basically have a sigma x operator which takes your qubit in state zero and puts it in a state one, or it takes it in a state one and puts it in a state zero. So basically the non-zero expectation of sigma x typically measures coherence between zero and one in that same way, the non-zero expectation value of closed x string would really measure this kind of coherent superposition nature of, of the state you create. So to measure this actually turns out to be somewhat non-trivial. So you basically need to perform correlated coherent rotation of the of the three qubit clusters. But this is something we actually learned how to do by adjusting blockade radius. And actually with, with that, we can actually measure now X strings, you know, again, you know, over, you know, loops of increasing size, you see that the the signal grow, uh, decreases, but nevertheless, you know, we see non-zero expectation value of the X string on quite sizable uh, uh, loops. And so this really is a signature of coherence between dimer current. So what is topological about all of this? And so to really reveal this um, topological properties, what we need to do is we need to con uh, compare closed loops versus open strings. And so, and here, the signature of the spin liquid phase is quite dramatic. So basically, if you just take the uh, closed, for example, Z string and compare it to the open Z string, you know, properly kind of normalized. So in a trivial phase, they are basically identical. But once you enter the spin liquid, you know, one of them is exact dead zero and another one is fine. Same thing with the X, you know, it's non-zero. Uh, here at the transition point, you know, both of them, but, you know, close to this um, spin liquid, you know, open strings go to zero, closed uh, strings stay finite. And one can actually use it to basically define an other parameter. It's actually other parameter could be open strings normalized by a square root of closed strings, and they can, you know, distinguish trivial phases, quantum spin liquid and other phases. And actually from here, you can really identify the domain, you know, where we can really can clearly see the onset of this quantum spin liquid phase. Just before I conclude, maybe I kind of mentioned that we also started kind of exploring some steps, making some steps towards topological qubit. So to create a topological qubit, you need to uh, basically create an array with non-trivial topology like a donut. So for example, we uh, uh, make a small hole in this array. And so basically it turns out that the small hole really divides all of these dimer coverings into two topological sectors. One is a sector uh, where, you know, has a, you have states which can be basically transformed into each other through basically local moves by just, you know, uh, resonating, you know, a few of these kind of effective dimers, you know, into each other. But, you know, then, you know, there are other states for which you, in order to basically connect them, you know, from one sector to another, you have to make a loop around this hole. And even for a small hole, it actually requires a very high order process to, you know, kind of to, to really convert one 
uh, state uh, into each other. And so basically, these two topological sectors can be <coughs> used to determine you know, two states of the topological qubits. So they're actually distinguishable uh, by the uh, parity of the string going from the middle hole to the boundary. Uh, and um, uh, actually, it turns out that these two states are degenerate in our, uh, um, in our system. And in fact, we can prepare, in principle at least, you know, any of the two superpositions. So in fact, uh, you know, to probe that you create a superposition, you have to have, uh, you have to look at the expectation value of the operator, which goes around the hole. So this is the operator which you know, X string, which connects, which would flip zero logical to one logical. And so if you measure, for example, non-zero expectation value around the whole, you know, then you basically can, you know, find that you create a superposition of these two topological states. And in fact, this is something which we can regularly do. You know, we indeed find that, you know, we have non-zero expectation value of the sigma X uh, string at the point where basically all of the other properties of spin liquid are satisfied. So it's kind of a first step towards topological qubit. So I think it's kind of was maybe a little bit too detailed, but you know, let me kind of take a step back. So this is a picture which maybe some of you have seen. So it was a very famous picture about 10, 15 years ago on the cover of Scientific American, where an artist, you know, tried to draw this idea of this, of this topological, you know, qubits and how you can basically, you know, create these anionic excitations and break them. So I think this, uh, you know, this artist must have thought that the physicist went nuts, you know? I mean, how can one possibly even envision, you know, things like this? So, and I'm sure, you know, if he didn't think about it while he was drawing, then I'm sure if he had learned that Microsoft invested hundreds of millions of dollars in this project, he would have come to this conclusion. But actually now, using the techniques which I have just described, it turns out that we can really do these things. You know, we can really create these excitations and braid them by just using these laser beams, you know, in a way and kind of moving these excitations around by just steering the system with the laser beam. It's actually very exciting. So you can now create this, uh, these exotic forms of matter you can probe them, you can, you know, poke at them, you can study them, you can use these insights, which we gain from the systems to you know, engineer more complicated, you know, um, uh, approaches. And, you know, finally, you know, we could use it as a platform to explore fault tolerant quantum information processing. So I think I'm a little bit running out of time here. So let me just, you know, uh, maybe skip this optimization part. And so I will just directly go to the kind of, you know, outlook. So given all of that, you know, what are the challenges and kind of uh, what are the opportunities? So, you know, so what I've shown you is that, you know, in our approach, we can basically create, you know, these arrays of atoms and, you know, read out these atoms individually. We can either excite them globally or we can excite them locally, you know, atom by atom. So, to really realize full potential of this technique, you need to learn how to simultaneously and rapidly excite the atoms in parallel. And you know this uh, can be done, but you need to basically work on some optical elements. You basically you need to create beam modulator arrays, which you can actually switch on a kind of nanoseconds uh, um, uh, uh, scale. This is something which we are exploring. So we are also working on increasing number of atoms and circuit depth, exploring some ideas of noise resilience in particular by controlling spontaneous emission and, and trapping Rydberg states as was already asked the question. So as I already mentioned, our slowest part in this entire procedure is the atom detection. This is true both for neutral atoms and for, super, uh, and for um, ion traps. And actually we have some ideas how to do it. And actually these ideas are also related to kind of networking between these atom arrays. And, you know, this is the, the, the kind of project which we're already um, uh, starting. And, you know, with, with that, you know, we hope to start exploring these ideas of error detection, corrections, and kind of larger scale applications. So this is just one slide about how we are now exploring this networking idea. So basically what we do is we introduce them into the vacuum chamber, a very small, tiny, um, kind of object, which is basically a photonic crystal cavity, which is suspended by the 
uh, by on on a fiber, which also allows you to kind of uh, efficiently couple photons uh, in and out. And then what we learned to do recently is we learned to basically you know plug the atoms one by one and kind of move them into this near field of this uh, photonic crystal cavity, and we can do it in a way which preserves atomic coherence and preserves entanglement. And I think this is actually a very exciting opportunities, opportunity which for both, you know, very fast readout, but also for scaling up, you know, creating larger and larger atom arrays. Okay, so I think that's kind of, you know, where this, you know, work is going. So I think I hope, you know, I gave you a little bit of a sense where this field is and, you know, brought to you to, you know, a little bit of a frontier area of this, um, of this uh, work. And then I would like to, Thank you know all the people whose blood and sweat resulted in all this work, and also you know thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lukin, for the very very nice talk. And we, uh, I think, we have time for only one more question now. Yeah. Um, yes, the question is: uh, Does the quantum spin liquid include long range dimers? For for instance, dimer with next nearest neighbor size. If yes, how can we realize it with with uh, Rydberg physics? Uh, so in our case, you know, we only, you know, effectively prepare short range dimers, right? Because dimer is basically is a is represented by one Rydberg atom. And of course, we can have long range correlations between the dimers, and this is exactly what we measure using the 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 string operators which i described it is possible to have a different approaches different representations of dimers and potentially you can have also dimers on a long range uh, between long range um uh you know uh kind of spins but this is not what we do so what we do we really implement something which is very close to this resonating valence bond stance, where the dimers are short range, but there is a correlations between dimers which are long range. Okay, all right, thank you. And uh, Professor Lukin, if you are like staying around for a while, uh, yeah. would you mind like looking through the questions from the Q and A channel? We have more questions there, so if you could answer some of them, that would be great. That would be amazing. You know, actually, if it if somehow someone could maybe save them and email me, maybe, maybe that would be the best, actually. Yeah, sure, I can do that. That I'll would be fantastic. Copy all the questions. Yes. Okay. Thank you no so problem. much, and it's great to see you. Thank you again, Professor. Yeah. All right. So next we have. Uh, Another talk from uh, Professor Suzanne Yelly, uh, who is a professor from uh, both University of Connecticut and also Harvard U University uh, of the Physics Department. So the talk is about cooperative order to the materials. Um, professor Yelly, uh, welcome. If you're ready. Yep. Hello. Can uh, no, you can. Can you actually see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. I'm, I should say I'm not at, at, at UConn anymore, um, but thank you for the introduction. Okay. And I thank see. you so much for having me. Um, I, I have to say a visit to Purdue is always a, a particular question, a, a particular pleasure. And it's great that you have me. And of course, the fact that it's virtual is a little minor glitch here. Um, so today I will be talking to you about a topic that is close to my heart um, very quantum and a, at the bottom of quite a bit of quantum information applications. It is not, however, kind of um, geared towards quantum information. From In that sense, it probably differs a little bit from, from what everybody else is talking about. Um, but I will mention um, at least at some places how, how that can be worked. Um, so before I start, um, please do ask questions. Um, I uh, my my talk is is modular, so um, I can just cut out modules and and can answer questions as long as this is wanted or needed. I will try to keep an eye on 
on um, the, the participants, but but um, it's a little bit much to handle. So if anybody has a question, perhaps you can just yell it in that would make it easier. Okay, so um, let me first start with start with with telling you a couple of the goals that that we have with this kind of work. So at the end, I will be talking about 2D arrays, something like what you see on the screen right now. Um, these, these goals could be any quantum radiators, but for simplicity, just imagine they are two level atoms and I will also be talking about atoms. And I will show you later how one can potentially use other materials, but for simplicity, just two level atoms. Um, then the question is, how can one use an array like that to reflect light um, in a quantum manner um, and with, with very high efficiency? Um, then the second module I will show you is how can we use this for spatial light modulation to, for example, write something interesting? Um, then I will go into the age old question, how can we make the effectiveness of the interaction of a single photon with a single atom or a single radiator better? Um, and here I just um, want to remind you of the size of, the, of an atom, which I will do when I get to this. And the question is, how can we use the, the array to make the effective size a lot, uh, a lot bigger? and use this potentially, for example, for quantum gates. And then perhaps even kind of build an on array quantum network. The next um, application will be, how can we do photonic edge states? And that goes a little bit into the topology questions that Misha has just talked about. And finally, I would like to briefly tell you how we can create a quantum mirror such that both the, um, the original and the reflected image are entangled, well, first superposition and then entangled, and how that potentially also can be used for quantum information science. So let me get started. Um, so the, the first part of the, the, the lecture kind of roughly consists of two parts. The first is an explanation of the particular a type of, of, um, of non-equilibrium interacting systems that is at the bottom of everything I'm going to talk about. And I will talk a little bit about the physics really in the, on the microscopic levels because I, for in the applications, I will not be talking about that anymore. And the second part, which is probably the longer part, um, I will just show you the number of applications that I have just mentioned. So let's start with the questions, why cooperative effects and um, why do we even bother? Okay, so the why do we even bother comes actually perhaps a little bit more only at the application side. So first I will explain what they actually are. So this cooperative effects is a little bit of a fancy name for um, what um, um, Robert Dick has started like um, over 60 years ago, who discovered what is mainly called nowadays super radiance. And um, here is a, is a quote from, the, um, from his paper, 1955, 1954 paper. Um, let me see whether I can actually kind of get the laser pointer. No, I cannot. Can you, it's, it's, um, so, so what he does, he says, for want of a better term, a gas which is radiating strongly because of coherence will be called super radiance. Um, and he did that apparently with a little bit embarrassment, um, but the, the name has stuck. And um, please do note that coherence is really the, the um, important word here. And below here is a, is a copy of the paper that he, that he did. So this is basically what, what we will build this on, on, but for that I would like to take a huge step back. Um, namely, um, briefly, what do I mean when I talk about an atom? So the atom, um, as you all know, has different orbits or the, the electrons have different orbits with different energies, which and these different energies or the, these orbits or states we call levels. 
And these levels, they have also sub levels, um, like, for example, hyperfine, Zeeman states, etc. And what we do in what all what follows is that we choose just pick and choose just the ones that we need of those. Most of the time that will be two. Um, like, like, for example, let's say here this one and the sub level of this one. Sometimes it will be three, and I will mention that when we need three. But um, if I talk about atoms, I really talk about these kind of picked and chosen sub level um, um, combinations. The next question is because that is again at the total center is how does it couple to light? So here we have the two levels um, with an energy of the upper level, an energy of the lower level. And we have a photon um, which has the energy H nu. And what we want is that the photon or the light field has the same energy as the, as the, different, the difference um, between these two atomic states. And if that is the case, then we can start with the atom in the lower state and a photon um, which then gets absorbed in order to lift the, the, the atom into the excited state, which we generally call excitation. And of course, then um, ideally this goes back and forth, right? And um, with that, I will start with the cooperative effects. Please again, um, interrupt me if there are questions. I think so far this is still kind of probably a review for most of, of listeners. So let's start with a single atom. A single atom in the excited state um, is subject to spontaneous decay. So spontaneous decay means the atom goes into the lower state and emits a photon. This photon, if we measure its intensity, um, gets an intensity probability, or, or if you do that often, an average over time, which goes down exponentially over time. So this is, um, this is single, single atom physics. Now we look at two atoms, but the two atoms are relatively far away. And if we do the same thing, we let them decay. They, of course, not necessarily decay at the same time and let them radiate. Um, we get still exactly the same intensity per atom profile that we had before. So now what happens if we put the two atoms very close to each other? And very close means very close to the compared to the wavelengths of this transition frequency. Um, if we let those decay and, and um, um, look at the photons, you can already see that the photons are now close enough that, that, the, that there might be some coherence between the two. And this coherence leads to the fact that our intensity over per atom profile now changes a little bit. And this is what the cooperative effect is really all about. So of course, this is getting much more interesting if we have many close atoms, all of them, please do note, start in the excited state, decay and emit. And please, here you already see, first of all, um, what ideally one gets is a coherent superposition of all of these photons. And because the atoms are so close together, their decay really um, happens in a coherent fashion, which is somewhat similar to stimulated emission, like in a laser or so. And in this case, the intensity per atom has a completely different profile. As you can see, it actually rises initially before falling off. And this is because there is a short time um, where, where we get this this strong kind of superposition between these, these atoms, like we have, sorry, strong superposition between the photons. And you know that, that um, if, you, if you have, if you add up the, the amplitude of n photons, the intensity goes like n squared. So this is why super radiance is an n squared effect. Okay, so this is, this is where this very, very strong peak comes from. And this is really what is at the end essence of, of pretty much any super radiance paper or research or whatever you, you would talk about. Um, mostly people also speak um, at the same time, not only about the photons, also about the atoms and call this a build up of collective dipoles. This is this kind of stimulated emission like 
type. And um, please do note that this collective dipoles is put in quotes because it's a little bit of a misnomer, but um, I'm not going into detail in, of that for right now. All right. Um, so there is thus two important aspects to cooperative effects. The one is the collective effects where you just have many particles which are close enough together to act coherent. And um, that has basically two, two, sorry, two aspects to it. Um, the one is that it's collective, many particles. One aspect that they have not mentioned is also that you, if you send a photon and want it to interact with atoms, obviously it has a much higher chance to interact at all if there's a lot of atoms than if there's only one. That's also typically kind of called um, a super radiant effect or often is. The second aspect, which I have not spoken about, is that the atoms actually have an effective interaction with each other. So they kind of um, exchange photons, both real and virtual photons. And this is, um, um, this is what amounts to the dipole-dipole interaction. And that's what we, what we go into now and, and also mostly later in the, in the talk. So, um, what that means, this, the fact that there's this exchange means that, they, that if I talk cooperative, that's actually more than just collective. Collective is just the first part. There's just many particles. Co cooperative also immediately means that there is some interaction between the particle that does something to the physics. And what it does, that's what comes now, okay? So the very simplest form of the, um, um, exchange interaction is what we do with this example. And um, this is the super radiance, which I just talked about. So this one, I, I like to kind of put that in a little bit more kind of populistic picture. Um, so what is the super part? It is not just um, this, this kind of good guy, Clark, um, who kind of is so great that it's really like you have a couple of them. But um, this, this um, strengthening of his powers actually results into something very different, namely Superman. Um, of course, I don't like Superman so much. I like Superwoman a lot better. But that's basically what you, how you should imagine super radiance or cooperative effects. So before I go and, and show you this in a somewhat more um, microscopic picture, I would like to briefly give you an outline um, of this lecture. So first I will um, go on with my explanation of cooperative effects, and then I will show you a couple of applications. And um, now let me start with that. So the easiest um, example, obviously, um, of having more than one atom, which kind of interacts, is two atoms. And that's exactly what we have here. So what I have on the screen here is the level scheme of two, two, sorry, two atoms, two level atoms, with, um, which are distinguishable. So the four, the four levels are GG, which is both atoms in the ground state, EE, which means both atoms in the excited state, EG, which is first atom in the excited state, second atom, atom in the ground state, and then GE, which is the opposite. Okay, so this is basically my first two atom picture where the atoms are far enough apart that they are distinguishable. So now what happens if they are indistinguishable? Then we cannot distinguish the GE from the EG anymore. And in such a case, the eigenstate of the system instead are the symmetric and anti-symmetric superposition of this, of the, the partially excited system. And so what happens if we now put an, put, put, um, an, an electron into this, or a couple of electrons into this upper level, um, where we have two excitations? Um, what it does, it will decay only via this pathway, via the, the um, symmetric state, or so-called thicker states, um, because the other two states are both forbidden. And both, um, basically, the two pathways from EE into EG and EE into GE destructively interfere on, on this pathway. So what happens is that basically um, two possible pathways, namely along this side and along this side, 
all condense into one and therefore we get the stronger effect of this decay. This is what we saw in this picture before. So as um, please to note before I go on, I have this orange names here. This is if you go into an angular momentum picture where you say J equals one um, and the triplet state, which is, which is the, the, the decay case or triplet state and J equals zero, M equals zero for the, for the single state, just, just for those people who want to see how to, how to read these states. Um, um, what I showed so far is basically, um, oops, sorry, is the case um, if there is no interaction. In this case, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric um, state are exactly the same, um, are exactly degenerate. But now we have, in addition, this dipole-dipole interaction. And what happens with this dipole-dipole interaction is that, that that splits the symmetric from the anti-symmetric state and, and can therefore be uh, distinguished. And at the end results in all of the, and results not in a very trivial manner, I should say, there's a couple of steps in between in all of these so-called cooperative effects. So it's really, both the indistinguishability and the, the fact that they are interacting with each other that makes something cooperative. Just in order to repeat myself often enough that this is clear. So this, um, there are um, two things that I also want to add to that. The one is that um, this exchange interaction in the system like this um, is usually dipole-dipole mediated. So when, when I talk about interaction, I talk about dipole-dipole interaction. It doesn't have to be though, but this is kind of all the numbers and curves, et cetera, um, that, that I show are based on dipole-dipole interaction. The second is that this interaction does not only create a shift, that's the one that, that I showed here with this error, but also a broadening or a dissipative um, a part which is basically exactly a Kramers chronic relation that you know from um, uh, reflection at, uh, the, um, um, from, from linear physics, only that this is a Kramers chronic relation that is really based on this nonlinear physics that one sees here with interacting atoms. And we will see this kind of shift and, and broadening relationship soon again. Okay. So what does is supervalence or cooperative effects? And here, this is basically similar to what I said before, um, just a little bit different words. So first of all, it's everything that involves thicker states. So thicker states are these fully symmetric states and everything that has basically um, collective effects, um, which usually go with square root of N, um, physical, a, a typical kind of physical um, system is a bad cavity limit of a laser. Um, most people would call that superradiance. But there is also the fact that only those systems are called superradiant that involve cooperative and nonlinear effect. For example, this exchange interaction that I want to tell you. So there is a little bit of a, of a, of a difference of opinions of what exactly constitutes superradiance. I'm of course of the, of the opinion of that it has to involve both a, or both number one and one, number two here. Um, and that's what I also assume for the rest of the talk. Um, and so super radiance, and I should have said that earlier, super radiance is actually the cooperative effect that goes with decaying atoms and, and the light emission. Cooperative effect is the whole field where you have systems like this. Um, this is all very hard to calculate, and I'm not going into detail, so I will go over this, um, over this um, slide just in order to get through and in order to prove that we have actually done it. Um, but here I show you just one example of what comes out. So this, this dotted line is just normal spontaneous emission. That's basically the same line that I showed you in this introductory slides. But then there's the blue and the red solid line. And the blue solid line would be just the coherence effect without the exchange or without the interaction, whereas the red gives the, and that's again, this intensity um, over intensity over time kind of picture that we saw before. Only if we actually have this exchange interaction, do we get true super radiance where, where the, where the, um, um, where we get this increase in intensity over time. 
Okay, so that was my very, very brief run through of what cooperative effects are. And um, we will not go back to super radiance and I will not give any um, microscopic explanations of the, in the, the interactions anymore. So now would be a good time to ask questions if you have questions about this part. Professor Jelen, I don't see uh, questions for now. So, okay, very good, yeah. excellent. Yeah. So then let's go on and let's have a look at, at application and all of the applications that I will show um, will be um, what we call atomically thin mirrors for, for want of a different words. It's not, the mirror function is not always used, but it's always the same system. So the system is, as I showed you before, just an ordered 2D array of, of atoms. And what we want to do, we want to do quantum optics with these atomically thin materials. And the goals of that is that, that we have a very strong optical response and, and that this optical response actually can be engineered. And um, in particular, um, which, which at the end will be very important, is that guided modes inside this material can be constructed. And so at the end, what we have is what one could call, oops, I'm sorry, what one could call an atomic matter surface. So let me briefly tell you how this works. So um, let me just give you an idea, the, the idea and set up. And um, here we are looking on the array of atoms from the top. So um, um, the, the first thing is look at, have a little bit of a look at the length scales. So I have put, as I put before, again, the cross sections of the atoms in here. These are these little circles around the atoms. And um, just to indicate that the lattice constant here is supposed to be roughly of the order of the wavelengths. There are interesting things that happens if the lattice constant is much bigger, but the exchange interaction or the cooperativity will not happen. There are also very interesting things where this is um, where, where the lattice constant is orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelengths, but the particular kind of um, um, effects that I will show you will need them of the order of magnitude, similar order of magnitude. So the question is, is this a system where we can get complete reflection from? And this, this, this is a very natural question because if you, if you look at all these cross sections that I, did, that I did there, it looks like the atoms about tile the surface here. So we could think there is a complete reflection and we can make some kind of educated guesses of what exactly the relationship between, between um, the, the wavelengths and the lattice constant should be. But it turns out um, if one calculates that, that it's not quite what we would guess and that it happens exactly at two values. Namely, this system acts like a perfect mirror if the lattice constant is exactly 0.2 or exactly 0.8 times the wavelengths of the transition. Um, I will explain you in a second where this comes from and how this looks like if we change our lattice a little bit. But here is a, is a nice picture that my, that my postdoc made to, to show this. Um, please do note here we have not perfect reflection. There's still a little bit of light going through, but it looks pretty at this point. So, and again, a reminder, we do need these cooperative resonances in this, in this situation. Nothing of what I will tell you works if we don't have the cooperativity. So first of all, I would like to give you a little bit of math. And this is very, very, very simple math that explains you why this perfect reflection happens. And this can be done by input output theory. So we are looking at the field that comes out on either side of our surface. Please assume, and we just assume plane waves here, an infinitely large lattice, the simplest case that you can imagine. So what we get as an outcoming field is the incoming field, um, which propagates in plus C direction. So it's e to the i k z times z. 
plus the, um, the, the scattered field, which is given by the second term with the scattering constant S. And if you look at, at what comes, what we want is reflection. So that means that um, if, we, if we find for some reason a scattering constant that is minus one, then you see that the forward direction, the one where, S, where, where Z is larger than zero, exactly cancels. So perfect reflection comes exactly if our scattering constant is minus one. So that means it's an easy problem. We just calculate the scattering constant, right? And this turns out to be exactly the following ex um, expression. And as you can see, it's basically like a normal Lorentzian, like what we, for example, would get from a from a 1D waveguide with a 1D um, radiator sit um, um, perfectly scattered, um, as, as I uh, coupled, um, where we have the gamma divided by the, the, the delta plus one half times e I times gamma, only that the gamma now has a gamma plus a collective gamma and the delta has a delta plus a del collective delta. And here, these collective terms are exactly come from the dipolar interaction between all the atoms and are exactly these two um, Kramer's chronic terms, namely the delta is the shift and the, the gamma is the, is the broadening. And um, these are basically just found, this is a, a complex number that's found by adding up all the possible interactions that you have between any two atoms on, on this lattice. So it's conceptual, conceptually very simple to do, numerically a little bit harder, depending on how your situation is. But if we now look at the form of S, then we see that we get this desired for S equal to minus one, exactly when the total detuning power, namely the outside detuning, namely the detuning between the light and the, the, the incoming light and the atoms, plus this collective detuning exactly at up to zero. Okay, so that is where our, where our um, perfect reflection happens. And so the, the simple thing is to just plot um, the function of this collective delta as a function of lattice constant over lambda. And we see that this crosses zero exactly twice. Um, and so this is the case where the, where the outside detuning is what I showed as small delta is equal, exactly zero. And you can see that this happens, these two crossing points happen exactly at 0 0.8 and at 0 0.2, which is exactly where we get our, um, our perfect reflection, um, which is this yellow curve here, which sh just shows the reflection coefficient. And of course, we can now look at a couple of other detunings and see that we can get actually perfect mirror pretty much anywhere between A over lambda equals to zero to A over lambda equals to one. And so this is actually a very flexible way to make this, to make this, this atomic mirror. Um, and um, with this kind of relatively simple explanation, let's go just one step further. First of all, I would show um, we, we have done this calculation so far just for a square lattice. Um, not very surprising if you have any other ordered lattice like triangular Kagome or hexagonal lattice, we get qualitatively the same results. It's just that the 0 0.2 and 0 0.8 go to, go to a somewhat, um, somewhat different numerical value. So there is, however, so this is this question of the reflection. There is one more aspect of this cooperative 2D array that is interesting and useful for applications. And that is if we look into the band structure of that. So the band structure of this is a, it's a very simple one. The inset on the right side uh, gives the, the gamma X and M symmetry points and which are, which are then plotted on the X axis of the, of the system. And um, we have the, the three directions in red, yellow, and blue, and the, the circular polarized in, in, in purple. Um, why is this interesting? This is interesting because we have two very distinct um, areas in that. The one which is close around the gamma point um, is within the so-called light cone. That means that the K value of the, of the excitation on the 2D lattice 
is smaller or at the borders equal to the K value of the light in vacuum. So that means in that case, the, the, the excitation on lattice can very easily couple to the, to the vacuum excitation. So if we have an excitation of that type, it will just radiate off in free space. On the other hand, if we are outside the light cone, that means that the K value is too big. And there, there, if it would radiate off into free space, energy would not be combined and would not be conserved. So what happens is that therefore, if we ever manage to get an, ex an excitation on the lattice somewhere outside of this light cone, this excitation basically will, will live on the surface forever, which makes the system, in addition to a mirror for light that comes in, also a very, very good um, wave guide in, in the case of these excitations that are outside the light cone. And for the applications that I will show you, um, we will combine this reflection and this wave guiding properties um, in order to manipulate our surface. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's go, um, let's look a little bit at the possible implementations that we can get in this case. So the first example is obviously atoms in an optical lattice. From what I showed, that is not very surprisingly the very most kind of straightforward way. And one example would be the, the um, quantum gas microscope that was developed by Markus Greiner and in the meantime is done all over the world. Um, it turns out that this is a very good system because it has basically all the right properties. But of course, it's a little bit difficult system to deal with. You need to build a quantum gas microscope, which is a major effort. So it would be nice if one also would have some, some way to, to make such a system in an easier way. And um, one other way are solid state 2D semiconductors, and in particular, the so-called transition metal dichalcogenides or TMDs or TMDCs, um, which um, if you look at the picture that Wikipedia shows from them, basically from the top look like a graphene lattice. So they are just really nice honeycomb lattices. But from the side, we see that the two ingredients, namely the transition metal like molybdenum or tungsten, um, make only half of the lattice and the other half is made by, by, by these dichalcogenides like sulfur and selenide, um, which kind of double up in the, in the kind of short direction um, such that, that from the top they, they, as I say, look like graphene and act to a large degree like graphene, but have one enormous, enormous difference. And um, this advantage, uh, difference, advantage, is that graphene cannot hold any excitons. So, um, and I don't want to go what, into what excitons are, but excitons are basically, the, if you excite any of the individual um, electrons in, in the system, they act a little bit like atoms. And they of course have, have major differences, but you can imagine then to, to have a similar structure to atoms. And, um, whether they exist or whether they are stable, and in particular, whether they have good selection rules is determined by the material. And it turns out that this is excellent in these TMDs. So because they are such great materials for excitons, there are actually um, ex um, a lot of experiments on those. And some of them are done also at Harvard by Hong Kong Park and Philip Kin. And they have actually done this mirror experiment with uh, molybdenum selenide. And here are two pictures of that. So this is um, on an HPN surface. And if you look at the left picture there, somebody drew in where the piece of, of, um, of molybdenum selenide is because you would not see it. You see the HPN, which is the, the kind of surface on which you grow this. You see the platinum leads, but you don't need this, this, this um, particular system. On the right side, however, you shine in light of exactly the right, um, the, the right wavelength such that it hits this mirror resonance that I was before showing you. And in this case, you see that this, that this piece of molybdenum selenide here 
is nearly as bright a mirror as the platinum leads. And um, this is a little bit slightly different from the situation that I showed you here is they, they also have drawn a spectrum of that. And I don't want to go deeper into this, but the point is in principle, this is an excellent system to, to do these kind of experiments. And when I now go back to, to, to various type of, of applications, Part of them are kind of with Adam in mind, and part of them are with TMDs in mind. And the next, um, the next application, the spatial light modulation, is actually on TMDs, and is in fact a, a, the, the experiment exists. And let me just briefly tell you about this. So, the idea about is that is so what what one wants to do, one wants to do spatial light modulation, ideally in a quantum level of single photons, et cetera. Um, but the, the, the thing here is that it's done on a nanosecond scale. So usually when you do light modulation, you need to kind of change your geometry, et cetera, and all of that takes time. Um, I think Misha in a very different context has, has talked a little bit about that. Here, um, this is, the goal is to do that very, very fast. So what is our systems? Here is again our scatterers, and these scatterers here are shown from the side. So they are in, into the screen, they are, they are um, long. And then one sends a little bit of light in there. And this light gets reflected. And this reflection you can see has, um, like this, this kind of typical Bragg scattering has, um, um, constructive interference in some directions and destructive interference in other directions. And where you will actually see the reflection are in the constructive directions, right? And I have already kind of drawn them such that you basically see the constructive um, um, direction. So now what happens, sorry, this is, um, what happens if you now take a part of the atoms, and I made them now a little bit darker, and change them. And I will sh show you in a second how, how you change them. You change them such that the reflection gets a different face. So this little bit darker blue has a different face. So now, um, when the face changes, this constructive interference happens in a different direction than it did before. And that's the whole idea of this, of this spatial light modulation. So this was my um, not very artistic rendering of that. So this is how the system actually really looks like. Um, and for this one uses a TMD. The TMD is in the middle of the picture. Um, and it's sandwiched between, between the, the HBN. Um, but importantly, it has two leads. The, the top lead, um, which is this gray one on the top, um, is, goes over the whole extent of the material. The bottom lead is basically creating this kind of dark red atoms that I had on the previous picture, um, and is only goes only over the over half of the of the distance, and thus we have this this disparity of the atoms, or it's not atoms, it's excitons in this case, which create um, these interference patterns, which is here shown in this in this on, on the top with these, with these different kind of outgoing waves. And we see that there's a certain direction where we have constructive interference. So that's, that's basically the whole picture. Um, and so the question is, um, sorry, first, this is how, they, how they, they, uh, the material looks like from the top. And what you can do now, so you have this, this, um, this line where, where, um, where the lead, um, up to where the lead goes. And now we can change um, the, the, the um, direction that the light takes perpendicular to this line. Um, the way how this ideally looks like um, is at the end, like in this picture, so this is again, this is an artistic rendering um, already of, of, um, um, of a situation where you don't have just one line, but here the inset in particular shows you how to change the phase of these, or how to change the phase of the reflected light. That is just done by changing the, um, the energy of the upper level of the excitons. Um, and this, this is, of course, this is very exaggerated here, but changing of the energy 
changes the phase of the reflected light and um, the, the, this combination um, leads to the fact that, that we can have the spatial light modulation and at the end, of course, ideally create some pretty pictures with this. Um, here is already a 2D picture is shown and I showed you only how to do that in 1D so far. So here is how to do it in 2D. So um, the, the, um, the, here the, it's basically that there are two, um, um, as you can see, there, is, there are um, bilayers, single, uh, 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 monolayers, dual gated, single gated, so that you have just three different results. And here the, there are these three different regions uh, marked with these, with these kind of outcoming photons. And if we, if you can um, steer um, the the the, um, um, the voltage of the three different regions, you can actually steer your beams in two different directions. And if you do this, then you can create arbitrary pictures in two directions. And this is this picture that I showed you in the beginning. Um, and please do note that these are actually. Um, um, a steering range that is rather macroscopic. So this is this is the y direction and the x, x direction in um, in actually degrees. So it's not huge, but you can actually measure it. So I should also say this is so far actually not really a quantum effect. This is a fairly strong um, light beam, and this is also mostly done via Bragg scattering. But of course, they, they, because of all of these of these quantum um, um, properties that this system has, um, the, the the kind of quantum effect is the next step from here. All right, let me make a brief break before I go to the next and ask whether there are some questions regarding this. Yeah, uh, I I I don't see any yet. Yep. Okay. Fine. Um, I did just, you can also just yell in, I'm not going to always wait forever, but so the next is, um, um, so now I really want to go to single photons and single particles. So here, and I give you only the very rough idea here without going into all the math, which, which kind of gets already a little bit. Um, I should also say the previous one was an experiment. This is so far only a, a theoretical proposal. So here we have a single atom, which we ideally want to kind of interact with a single photon in free space, um, which is hard. The cross section is um, only a lambda squared, as I said, and the, the, the photon can be anywhere in space. So if you send the photon in there, the, the, the likelihood of them to interact is very small and we don't want that, we want it deterministic, right? So what we do, is we put the single atom as an impurity in such an array and hope that we can get the cross section as big as the array. So you can thus imagine the array as a kind of a fishing net or antenna array, but in a quantum matter, there are actually um, major differences to an antenna array, but intuitively that makes a lot of sense to actually get, catch all the light and all concentrate it. On the single on the single impurity atom that we have in the middle, and so the question is, how well does this work? So we have a couple of pictures um, where we just looked at what happens if we have only an impurity in free space and normalize the scale that we have here to to exactly the scattering of of a single atom in free space. Um, we get the factor, the highest factor is two because we have an interference between, between um, um, or that, so because of near field effects. And um, so this, this, this one and two here set the scale of, of, the, of the scattering strengths. Now we look at the same thing where we have the atom array in, in the, not quite at the reflection, but very close to the reflection um, um, parameter. Um, and here we see the scale actually goes up to four compared to the previous one, which is because we have constructive interference on the really bright spot. And now the question is what happens if we put the two together? 
What comes out um, is a picture roughly like that. And here I would like to emphasize that this is on a very different scale. And we plotted this only up to 100, but it turns out that very close to the atom, it's uh, to the impurity, it's actually considerably higher than that. And um, I don't want to go into the calculation, but I would like to kind of tell you one more detail, namely, um, you remember when I showed you this, this um, band structure um, before, where I said where in principle, um, the atoms are not allowed to, to um, in, interact with the, with the, um, with the um, environment. Now, if you go even a little bit further out, these excitations cannot be held at all. So what you do, you detune the, 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 in the impurity a little bit from the array and make sure to send in exactly the right, the right photon frequency. And there is this, this region where the, the, the array can um, guide the photon, but cannot hold it. So there are only virtual excitations on the array. And because the excitation has nowhere else to go, it all goes on the impurity. So we really truly have a kind of a fishing net for a single atom, uh, for a single photon. And of course, um, what we want to do here is we want to ideally kind of have two impurities or two qubits um, being able to interact. And so we put both of them on there and look at how well they talk to each other now. Given the fact that the, that the array doesn't hold excitations, but the impurities do, um, the expectation is that we would have just an interaction either on the one impurity or on the other or some kind of exchange between the two. And this, as it turns out, actually exactly happens. So first, I would like to briefly um, quantify this a little bit. So how good is this coupling between the impurities? And this is kind of drawn as um, compared to the decay into free space. So one example would be that, where we just look at the two impurities, impurity one in blue and impurity two in orange. And let's just run, run it. So the, 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 the question, how far does that go, is basically an effective kind of um, an effective interaction strength between the two. And you see they decay, the quality of that decays, but relatively slowly. And what is the quality factor of this? Um, so we are basically on this, on this narrow yellow kind of line in the parameter space. Please do know for some reason I cut off the, the X axis I show you in a second. So this is the tuning versus, versus the, the, um, the um, decay ratios. And here we can see that we get a quality factor, which is about up to 10 to the two. And there are other regions in the parameter space where exactly the opposite happens, where when there's basically no coupling and everything goes off. And here is a little bit different place in the parameter space. Sorry, I tell, told you something wrong. On the x-axis is actually this, this A over lambda region. And as you can see, this kind of fully reflective kind of region turns out to be somehow close to where we want to be. Please do note that in the second example, we have changed something else, which I don't want to go into. Um, but here, the, the quality factor actually goes to 10 to the six or even better. So we can really kind of fully have this, th these two impurities interact with each other without losing anything. Um, I would like to say that we actually did a, a couple of more things for that. Um, so we, um, first of all, there is, uh, if we have a single atom, um, this is in principle a perfect nonlinearity because it's an atom and not a harmonic oscillator. In order to prove that, one has to find the transmission G2 function, which we haven't done yet, but this is in the works. And then, of course, the idea is that we use this kind of interacting two or many um, um, qubits on array in order to make somehow ideally um, um, networks of those and also make gates. And in order to make gates, one needs to kind of access more than just two levels. One access needs to access at least three, but we have some work which is so far not published yet, which is which also shows that you can do kind of CNOT gates and stuff like that between those levels. So, and I see I have with questions only 10 minutes left. 
The next part would be the topology. And um, if you have questions regarding that, I will show that. Otherwise, I will just go jump directly to the last um, to the last topic, which is the, the uh, quantum matter surface, especially given that Misha has talked so, already so much about topology. So um, the quantum net matter surfaces basically now goes back to atoms and starts again with basically exactly the, the, same, um, the same idea. I should say, again, this is just a, a theoretical proposal. Um, as you can see, it's a little bit more quantum than everything else. So that's, that's probably of all what I showed you so far the hardest to do. So what happens if we have now a superposition of such a state with, an, with a state where, where all our atoms are actually excited? And ideally, our superposition state is actually a cat state, or not ideally, but as an example. So either all of the atoms are in the ground state or all of the atoms are in an excited state. So we have an, an, a cat state of this, um, of this whole array. So this, this, um, there are, of course, now two questions. Um, first of all, how can I create something like that? And I will show you that in a minute. And the second question is, what happens if we have that and shine some light in? And that's the question which I first will answer. So let's assume um, we have this quantum reflection. So this 0 0.2 or 0 0.8 that I showed you before. In this case, um, if our, if our um, array is in the ground state, we get exactly this reflection, which we call um, flip up. Alternatively, we can have this in the excited state, in which case this mirror thing does not happen and the light just goes through. Please do note that compared to a real mirror, like the silver mirror that we all have in our bathroom, um, these, these, these arrays are extremely dilute. So unless you work hard, everything will go through. And this is exactly the, the situation that we have here. So this is if, if the flip is down. But now if we have the superposition of the two, we actually really have a superposition of reflection and transmission. And so what we effectively get, we get the superposition of atomic responses and entanglement of the state of the, of the atoms with the state of the field, namely whether it gets reflected or transmitted. And this is basically what, what I was hinting at when I showed you this, this picture in, in the introduction. We cannot quite do apples yet, um, but hopefully um, we can do something more useful. And so the question is, how do we do to get, how do we get this, these um, superposition arrays? So for that, we need um, two more um, ideas. Um, one of which Misha has talked about that are Rydberg states. Um, um, and Rydberg states are very interesting because they, they have a very, very strong interaction over a very large distance. So I'm not going into detail about that. The second is EIT or electromagnetically induced transparency. Um, and what that is, um, is that you have, if you have a three level system, for example, like this three level system that we have on the side, if the two end states, which would be the ground and the Rydberg state in this case, um, are coupled by two fields via the mid middle state, which is the normal excited state, um, the, the, the middle state basically suddenly becomes invisible or transparent, and the trans transition to that becomes transparent if we have two photon resonance of two fields with G and R, okay? So in this case, in this first picture, that is exactly the case. So this transition G to E is invisible for the light. Invisible means mirror doesn't work, light goes through, right? So the other case is if we have, um, and, uh, uh, um, and here the picture is not, I, I, um, it's not quite accurate. So we have a, a Wittberg state that is up here. And our, our fields now are not quite, um, um, actually, you know, the Rydberg state is here, but the eigenstate of the system is up here because um, there is very, very strong interaction between a Rydberg state and another Rydberg state. And 
this very strong interaction kind of effectively lifts the state. So our three states would now be this upper state and the single excited state and the ground state. And of course, now our two fields are not in two photon resonance with that anymore. And therefore, this transition suddenly becomes visible. If this transition is visible, um, we are in the mirror situation and we get this thing reflected. So why is that a nice situation? Because even one single Wittberg um, atom in this, in, this, um, in this situation is enough to, to switch us between, the, between the, the, the left transparent and the right reflective situation for all the other atoms. Right, so um, that means that that what we need is not a superposition of many atoms, but we start with the superposition of only this one atom. So we basically our cat state um, originates from one kind of superposition of a Rydberg in a ground and a Rydberg state, and this basically gives this whole picture um, of 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 a of a um, of a um, quantum atomic response. And as a very last picture, I would like to show that this now can be used for in a very simple manner um, for quantum information science. And in this particular case, for example, for quantum error corrections. So here, these green, these green lights are the beams. The beam that goes through, we call zero qubit. The beam that gets reflected, we call one qubit. And instead of having this whole array act together, we use as a, as a single kind of qubit, effective qubit, we just use small areas of the arrays. And because we now can act with them all in parallel, we have massive, um, massive redundance in the system and have therefore an automatic error correction, even if we send in only a single photon. And, um, this, this goes down to what is called three cluster states and um, which or um, and quantum light modulation for for single photons and um, I'm not going into any details of that because my time is up um, I do have an outlook which I which is also not so important right now because I really want to show collaborators um, the five people at the top are the people who made the who did the most work um, Effie was my postdoc, he is a professor at Weizmann right now. He, he kind of invented all of this 2D material stuff um, with, with, the, with this mirror, et cetera. Taylor Petty is my student. She did the single, single, single atom and single photon. And Janos uh, did the topological. Um, he he um, graduated from Mischer's group and has now his own company. Trond did the spatial light modulation. He is still a, a student in Mischer's group. And Rivka was a postdoc here, or is actually still a postdoc here, but is on her way to, to take a position in Jerusalem. So, and the rest is, the left is all my, my group, who also contributed somewhat, but not as much. Um, other students and postdoc and, and PIs. And um, then I, of course, want to give my, thank my money givers. And finally, I want to thank all of you for listening. And, Thank you very much, Professor Yellen, for the very, very interesting talk. And for, for, the, uh, for the audience, if you have any questions, you can just feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak up. So while we're waiting, I do have a question uh, regarding like the reflection, reflector work you mentioned. Mm -hmm. so basically, uh, based on my understanding, uh, for the perfect reflection, you like uh, you will require like uh, the lattice, the atom spacing, something like uh, near the wavelength. Yeah. Right. Uh, but uh, you also showed in another work that uh, for the, the people have done it with TMBCs. Yes. So how is how does that work? That's 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 exactly that's you you exactly put your finger on that. And this is why the TMDC work is not perfect. So obviously the lattice constant in the TMDC is, a, is a priori the lattice constant of the, of the semiconductor, which is kind of, of, of course, of the nanometer range, right? Mm -hmm. And while the, the light is still somehow close to visible. So this, this gives us a, quite a couple of orders of magnitude difference, like five mm -hmm. or so. Um, so 
one of the ways and you still get the mirror but the mirror is now the mirror um, 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 resonance width is now given by the by the native exciton wavelengths and it's um, it's not quite as manipulable as it would be this day if you would have the correct distances so people have been thinking of how to change these distances and there are various ways to do it the most promising and what people are trying to do right now is to use the so-called moiré patterns mm -hmm. um, double lattices and these moiré patterns if you if you take two of these lattices and make and overlay them with a very small angle between them gives a lattice that has an effective lattice constant that that it get, grows much bigger as you make the angle smaller. Mm. And um, um, the hope is that the effective lattice constant kind of takes this Moray lattice constant, um, but um, this is difficult and nobody has really quite proven that this is possible yet. So there are a couple of things that you can do with this TNDCs already and a couple of things that hopefully kind of will work, but yes, that's a work in progress. I see. I see. Thank you. And uh, like among all the like uh, quantum optics ap applications you mentioned, which one do you think is like the uh, will have the most exciting <laughs> near term applications, like realization in terms of like practical realization? So I I did not I did not um, talk about all of them. And I, I really I mean, you asked me about near term. So most exciting and near term is not. The, I think the quantum matter surfaces is probably most exciting. The most near term, however, is one that I didn't even show you. The nice thing is that this, that this is a mirror which has its own um, uh, degrees of freedom, namely whether it's actually a mirror or not. And it's also extremely, extremely, extremely light. And so an, a very interesting application of that would be um, quantum optodynamics, uh, sorry, optomechanics. And namely, when you have a have a, a quantum interaction between inner cavity with either one or two of those 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 um, atomic mirrors, um, and it turns out that these are not that hard to make, and have I mean from the numbers of of how far you can now get down with cooling or how well you can actually couple the light to the to the to the modes of the of the mirror, um, the 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 numbers that you get there is extremely extremely promising, and I should say um, the reason why I didn't include that is that Effie who is now at Weizmann, I mean that's right now basically his main or one among his main topics, and he has written a number of papers of that, and so I I kind of I. <laughs> Um, he is really the owner of that, but I think that one should be actually pretty easy to realize, and you can really go down to you can really go down to to quantum level with that. I see. And all right, so let me check. Uh, we do have a question from the from the chat. So yep. the question is, how quick is the transition between the reflection and non-reflection state? So um, if, 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 if one uses this, this setup in, in this last example that I showed, that's basically just the time that it takes you to, to, um, to excite a Rydberg state. And the time it takes, it, this is usually done using stirrup and I'm not going into stirrup. Um, it depends on the particular atom, but it's um, of the order of magnitude and probably a little bit faster than the typical de decay time of an atom. So, um, which which kind of would put it somewhere between the um, um, nano and microsecond range. Mm, I see. And actually, I should also say that what I showed in the beginning, this kind of fast um, fast light modulation is basically, I mean, that's limited by a somewhat similar, um, by a somewhat similar time scale. So whatever time scale you can do with the one, you probably can do with the other. Okay, great. Thank you, Professor. Um, I don't right. see other Thank questions. You. Yeah, but uh, I'll be happy to follow other uh, questions from the audience if they have yes. 
in the yeah after the again um if you email me questions in case you're interested i will be happy to answer them all yes right. thanks very much all Professor. right thank you so much okay and all right thank you again uh for all the attendees and the audience so we